The Lone Ranger and Tonto were riding down the path one day when they looked around and realized that they were surrounded by uh, Indians. And Indians had snuck up on them and they all had arrows knocked and pulled. And, and the Lone Ranger looked down at Tonto and says, Looks like we're in trouble, Tonto. Tonto responded, What you mean we, white man? Y'all heard that before? I heard that uh, a while ago, me and a bunch of other people in our 20s. We all laughed because the first time we'd heard it. But it was, it was a joke told to make a point. We. Who is we? What an interesting word we is. Because whenever you say we, what are you doing? You're assuming that we're all in this together, that we have something to common, in common. And as soon as you say we, what does that imply? There's a them, right? If there's us, then there's got to be a, a them. There, there's got to be a, a, a distinction there, a sense of distinctiveness. What makes we, we? And, and under pressure, Tonto kind, kind of questions that himself. But uh, what makes us, us? What, what's distinctive about us right now? Well, we're all gathered here in the name of Jesus. That, that's what makes uh, this we, that's what com combines us together. And, and so if there's us gathered as God's people, you know what everyone outside the walls are? Them. People who are not got, gathered in the name. Uh, and there are other churches, let's not get in semantics, but you get the point, right? There is us and, and there is them. We who are gathered in the name of Jesus and, and them who are, are not. And... and what we read of in Scripture and what I read of today out of the Bible is there's an ongoing struggle throughout Scripture to maintain the clarity of who is the us and who is the them. What is it that makes we distinct? What makes us the people of, of God and, and how do we hold that distinction and hold on to it dearly? We read uh, out of the book of Judges, which if you ever read the book of Judges, it is the Wild West of the Bible. The craziest stuff, it, Judges takes the cake for the most creative use of a tent peg I've ever read. And if you know the story, you, you'll agree. And if you don't know the story, you need to go read Judges. Because there's a lady who uses a tent peg to masterful effect. And, um, but the, the story of Judges and, and Samson and all, all the craziness and the assassinations and the wars, kind of, if, you, if you read and you get too in close, you kind of lose the big picture of what's going on. Because what's happening in the book of Judges is that the, the Jewish people have gone into the promised land and they are surrounded by all these other nations, all these other communities. And, and they have been taught by God to live a certain way. And all these other surrounding communities do not live that way. And they're trying to hold on to what makes us, us. And, and sur the surrounding communities, they, they live differently. They lived in a way where 2% of the population controlled all the land. And all the money from all the land went to the big farmers. And, and in Israel, they, they were all to have their individual family land. And no one was to have a big farm. Everyone was all have their own family farm. And in the surrounding uh, Fam, the surrounding communities, them, it, the rules were jiggered so that if you had money, you, you got ahead. You could control the law. Whereas in Israel, if you had more money, it didn't matter. All law was equal. The law was... And so you can go through and, and, and look at the way that... Uh, and and the, the communities surrounding them... Uh, witchcraft and child sacrifice was used to try to control the gods. And in Israel, there was a very clear sense, no, God controls us. That's the, don't get that out of, out of whack. And, and so the book of Judges is this struggle to, to, for us to be us and for them to be them. We're distinct, we're following God, they're not, let's be clear about that. And, and what we read was a story where it's starting to go astray, where the family's starting to break down. A son has stolen 1,100 silver pieces from her, his mama. And his mama just takes it back and doesn't beat the daylights out of him, which is amazing. And, and then she wants to say thank you to God for getting the silver back. So how do you say thank you for, to God? What does she do? She makes an idol. I mean, it tells you that things are starting to really get out of whack because she takes 200 silver pieces and she makes an idol out of it. One of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not make any graven images. And, and so when that distinction between us and them is starting to break down, that's when God sends a king so to lead the people and they can hold together again. 
But this sort of struggle shows up in other places in Scripture as well. Down the road, we, many centuries down the road, we get the story of, of Daniel. And, and what's the deal with Daniel? The, the Hebrew people have been sent into exile because they have not been faithful to God. The, the we, they've lost that distinctiveness, that what makes us, us, as we follow God, they've lost that. And so God is disciplining them and reminding them who's in charge. And uh, so they go into exile, and we have these four, uh, Daniel and his three very hard-to-pronounce friends, and, um, and they have to figure out what, how they're going to live, right? They, they have to be faithful to God. They have to maintain the we, the us that makes them followers of God. But, but they also have this challenge because God has also told them there's a letter written to the people in exile in a, just as Jeremiah 29. A letter says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile. And, and so there's this sense that the these four guys, they have to both be faithful to God, but God has also told them you have to seek the welfare of where you're at. You have to serve the, where you have been planted. And so there is this struggle. What they, they have to serve the Babylonians, but they can't become like the Babylonians. They, and so what we read is Daniel makes this decision. He will serve, but he's not going to eat like them. He's not going to eat the fancy food. And they later decide that they're not going to bow down to idols. And they don't bow down to idols, the, the worship of the Babylonian culture. And it gets them in a hot spot, and uh, they end up being thrown into a furnace, and that's a whole other sermon. But, but that shows, I mean, they have to hold this line that we will serve, but there's a sense that we, we're holding on to what makes us, us. Even while you're them, we are, are us. We've got to hold on to that. And you can go through the Old Testament and find other examples of this. King Solomon was very, starts out very wise, and then later on he starts using forced labor to, to build his, his uh, palace. And, and that's when the nation splits, because there, he's a Jewish person enslaving other Jews. That's how they work. That's not how we work, right? That the people of God do not enslave people, and, but he is, and that's when the nation splits. And what happens when... Uh, when Solomon's great, 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 many, many great grandsons rises to the throne, the way that he sort of calls the people back and the nation rises again, King Josiah, what he does is he finds a copy of the law and he gathers the people and says, this is how we are to live. And when all the people gather and say, yes, we will live like that, that's when the nation starts to rise again. And, and so it's there's this continuing struggle. Will the people of God be faithful to what makes them unique, what makes them a, a we. And that, that's the challenge that, that the people of the New Testament face. That's the challenge that, that we face today. Because there's no easy answer. There's no... Ch if you look at the front of your bulletin, there's a Venn diagram there. This is our life, right? In the green circle, what's it say? Are calling as disciples, right? That, that's what we are called to do. That's what we are called to do as followers of God. And then the orange is uh, what the rest of the world expects and does. And, and so this, this is a way of looking at and visualizing what we're talking about. How do we maintain our we ness and, and even surrounded by they who do not share what makes us us? And, and there, there are two simple answers to, to this question. And as with many simple answers, they're simple, elegant, and wrong. One simple answer is to withdraw from the world and just to pull back and have nothing to do with the world because they, they're messed up out there, right? You know, we got it right in here, but all of them out there, you know what they are? They're wrong. And we got it right in here, they're, they're out there, and we can just be in here and be right. And isn't that tempting? Isn't, wouldn't that be wonderful? Eh, doesn't work, does it? You know, we, we, God doesn't just say, follow my covenant, live by my law. He also says, go out and serve. Seek the good of the community you're in. So we can't do that. And honestly, Methodists don't tend to. We tend to go the other way. And what's the other simple answer? You just, you just go, out, you go out from these doors and you go out and you just blend in. All right? you, you, don't, you just blend in and you don't look different. And you come to church on Sunday and that's good, but you go out and, and no one ever notices any differences from you because you're, you're just with everyone else and doing what they do and along for the ride. And, and, but what happens if you do that? Are you being we? Are you holding on to what makes us us? 
And, and so our, our, to follow Jesus, our calling is to live right there in that really weird, odd color right in between. To live there in the middle and to live in the tension between the fact that we are called to be citizens in the kingdom of God. We, we follow Jesus in the kingdom, his kingdom that's coming. And that kingdom has no end. And that kingdom is on its way. And we're also citizens secondarily of America, of Milan, of Missouri. And we're citizens of, of Jesus' kingdom first, but while we're here, we serve the, the place that we're at as much as we can, keeping it track that we're always to follow Jesus first. And if it sounds like that's, that's not a really simple answer, well, you're right, it's not. It's an awkward answer. It's an answer based on the reality that uh, we're not to Jesus' kingdom yet, and there are things that are different. There are things that are the same, right? Both as Christians, we say we should tell the truth, and as Americans, you say we should tell the truth. That's good, right? That, that we agree. But uh, there are also some differences. When Jesus said, Jesus' direction would be, if you have enough, stop. Enough is enough. If you have what you need, you, that, that's fine. What does America say? What would be the best thing for our economy right now? If you have enough, what should you go and do? Buy more, right? Consumer spending is what drives our economy right now. So the single best thing you can do for our American economy is go out and buy a new dishwasher. I mean that in all seriousness. That's the single best thing you... Or buy a new car, why not, right? Buy as much as you can. And there's a difference there. Both Jesus and this nation expect us to, re to remain faithful to our spouses. It's good for uh, us. We believe that we are meant to be lifelong, committed, covenantal, loving relationships. And our, uh, the country expects us to do the same too. It, it's better for raising kids, all those details. But, but Jesus tells us to serve everyone in need. Who would the state prefer we serve? Taxpayers, right? Sta the Amer Missouri likes to pay, spend its taxpayer dollars on taxpayers. Right? There's, there, and so there are always going to be these places where, and, and there's a whole lot more comparisons we can make. There are places where to be Christian and to be part of the surrounding culture are going to line up, and there are going to be places where, where they do not. And, and to, find, to stand in the middle between the, those two and to find a, the, the solid rock to stand on when it seems rather complicated to figure out what to do, that, that's a challenge. Well, where do people go in the Bible if they need to find wisdom, if they need to figure out how to respond to a challenge? There is one place people go in the Bible when they need to get their head on straight. Again and again, where do the people of the New Testament go when they want to be baptized by John? Where is John at? When, when the Hebrew people don't go into the promised land and they need to learn how to trust God, they spend 40 years, where do they spend 40 years learning to trust God? When, where does Elijah go when he has his, his midlife crisis? Where does Jesus go before he begins his ministry? The wilderness, right? Again and again, in the Bible, if you need to get your head on straight, if you need to figure out a challenging question, if you're facing a problem that is complex, where there is no simple answer, what you do is you go to the wilderness. That's, that's the, you can almost see the wilderness as a school, God's wilderness school where God trains people and speaks to people and tests people and shapes people to be able to handle the challenges of, of life. We go to the wilderness because we need to find wisdom in this tension between what uh, we do as Christians and what they do as not. How do we handle that balance in a way that is graceful and respectful? We're going to spend some time between now and Easter looking at the wilderness. We're going to look at how Jesus goes in the wilderness, how the people seek John the Baptist to be in the wilderness, how the entire people of God go in the wilderness. We'll look at how Elijah handles his sort of midlife crisis by going into the wilderness. We're going to, those are the next Sundays we're going to look at. And this is uh, fitting for this time of Lent. It's the time where we are sort of figuring out what is it that we need, how do we need to grow to follow Jesus more faithfully. We'll, go to the, we'll be going to the wilderness. But I want to give you a small taste, a small example of what we're talking about when we talk about the wilderness, because it's the beginning of Lent. And I think thinking about the wilderness helps us figure out what we do during Lent. Because we all are going to do something for Lent, right? That's the Christian practice. You're going to do something for Lent. And if you're anything like me, what happened is Ash Wednesday hit and you thought, I should do something for Lent. I should figure that out. 
And, and it always takes me from Ash Wednesday to the first Sunday to figure out what I'm going to do. And, and it's sad, and one of these days I'm going to get my act together, but it wasn't this year. Um, but what helped me figure this out was to think about what do you hear when you're in the wilderness? What do you hear when you're in the wilderness? Silence, right? You hear silence. You hear just stark nothing. And when you hear nothing, what do you pay attention to? What are you listening to? You start hearing things you don't usually hear. You start hearing yourself. It's just you and yourself and the silence as the sun beats down, as the wind blows across the, the plains and you see the birds fly down. It's just silence, right? And when you have some silence, you can listen to yourself and you can listen to God a lot better. And what's the other thing you hear in, in the wilderness? You hear music, right? The birds... To, and the birds and, and, and the rustle of the wind through the trees and you, you hear sort of the music of, of, of nature and um, music is, is what we offer back to God it, out of ourselves and, and so silence and music if, there is, if, there, if you don't intend to make any sounds in the wilderness you have silence and if you do intend I mean that's sort of the music that's when you, you are doing things with people singing or whatever um, what is our world mostly full of other than silence and music? What do we get a lot more of? Noise. Right? How much noise do you hear day to day? Just chatter. The 24-hour news cycle. Everyone's got to be talking because there's always something to talk. Actually, this week there really is something to talk about. But uh, there's always got to be someone talking and, and all the LCD screens flashing at us and all the computer screens and, and the beeping of the cell phones and the tablets and the computers and, and all the noise that's out there. You don't get any of that in the wilderness, do you? I, I've never run into anyone who says, you know what, I need to get back to God. I need to turn on some noise. What do people do when they need to find God? They go and they, they go to the wilderness and they either get more, no, more silence or more music. And so I want to ask you to consider this day, and, and I have these questions written down on a piece of paper to take with you. Uh, I want to ask you to consider, where do you experience silence in your life? And how might you intentionally spend more time in silence? Where do you experience music? And how might you, between now and Easter, get a lot more of it? And where do you experience noise? And how might you cut that down? I hope that in answering these questions, you might start to experience at least the smallest slice of what the wilderness can be for us. The place that helps us seek and find the wisdom we need to maintain that this stand so that we can be we, we, us can be us, we hold on to what makes us the people of God but also do it in ways that we, we go out and seek the good of the community, that we do that and do that well as well. Amen.